in San Diego, from Bascon 2, uh, from Vinac, from UB, UB, UNASA. And so by being here today, I think we can work on the premise that all of us, almost all of us, uh, accept that we are in part Vietnamese and we we'll work on that premise. Agreed? Okay. Uh, can we get a yay or nay there? Yay! yay.
Um, so that was that was candy and flowers and nice and everyone got a little bit of a job and it was kind of a nice flower that your heart's beating a little bit harder. And I'm sure everyone's excited because I'm, you know, I'll get to my seat. But here's the thing. All these people that you just hugged and you were like, yeah, you look nice. Are you like really good friends with that person right now? Like do you do you know what the favorite colors are? Are you you feel closer to that? Excellent, excellent. Do you I mean do you know what his last name is? Other than looking on his name tag, or do you know what her favorite color is? Or where she came from, or what she does, or what her hobbies are. I think you guys are going to realize where I'm going when I say, yeah, it was really nice to have that embrace. And to say that, you know, you look nice, I feel close to you right now, but, you know, is that really enough to be someone's friend or to be very, very intimate or close with someone? Is that really enough for you to say, you know what, I really feel Vietnamese because I eat pho and drive a rice rocket and live, you know, close to Bolsa? <laughs> I don't think so. I really don't. And I don't want to offend anyone here because, I mean, Speaking Vietnamese is great, you know, understanding, uh, reading Vietnamese is great, speaking of Vietnamese adults is great, uh, learning about the history and the culture and the art, that's all great stuff, right? I mean, these are all just semantics, they're all just tangible, you know, like you can pick it up and like you use that to measure how Vietnamese you are, but that really doesn't count, it doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, what matters is, you guys are all sitting in this room, and it's not the fact that you came to Vietnam, it's not the fact that you paid the registration and flew or drove here, it's the fact that there was something inside you that made you want to do it. There is a reason that you're here. It's not the fact that you're here, because the facts don't really matter. Because at the end of the day, I can say I'm Vietnamese because I speak Vietnamese, because I, my parents were Vietnamese, I've been to Vietnam a thousand times, but you know what? A lot of people do those things, a lot of people do these things just because they feel like they have to, or because someone else is telling them to. But the fact that you guys are here, and you know, I don't think anyone held a gun to your head and said, go to Vietnam, I'll kill you. I think the important part is there's something inside you. There's something that drives you to learn more, to share, to be part of the Vietnamese community. Um, I don't know if there's a, an appropriate English word for it. Though well, maybe it's the soul, the heart, or you know. In Vietnamese, you might call it thumb thumb, right? And this is this is something that we all obviously have by merely being present today here as Vietnamese Americans. Uh, you know, tapping into a, a sense of Vietnamese, collective Vietnamese, mobility, come to Vietnam. Exactly. And what happens here is because we all have that drive, and it's taking us in a similar direction with one another, it, it reminds me of this, this saying that my dad told me a while ago from a Boon Zoom Ming. And the saying goes, Ngoi bà không thích chi, như tuyển không lại, như ngựa không cư. Which means a person who doesn't have that direction, who doesn't have that drive, essentially is like a boat with no rudder, horses with no reins, just drifting aimlessly, worthless and useless to society, and not fully a member of society. And I think what you guys are all doing here is exhibiting the fact that you are not these rudderless boats or these rainless horses and that you are trying and will be and are currently valuable and effective members of society. Now this one you may wonder, we made a strong argument for, not so strong, but an argument for uh, embracing Vietnamese culture. Now some of you may put the question in the opposite direction. Why? For what reason? We live in America. When in Rome, why not do as the Romans? Living in America, you don't need to know Vietnamese to succeed in America. In, in America, we are marked with different languages, cultures, ideas, the key to success, typically, or you know, traditionally, is assimilation. To acquire the new language, acquire the new set of values, and to forget the ways of the old country. And people who do that usually are rewarded with success by being accepted by the society as a whole. And people may define such success, but all it really is is it shows your adaptability, your, your ability to see someone's set rules, see the status quo, learn those rules, and play by those rules. It's not necessarily a sign of strength. Conversely, on the flip side, those people who hold out, who resist, who have their own set of rules, I've got my way of doing things, be damned, and everyone else has to, will not con conform entirely to the status quo, will hold out, and force other people to compromise, to change,
to alter their viewpoints in order to incorporate some of your own. Those people are the people who go out and they change the world. Those are the people who are the leaders. Those are the people who are the visionaries. And those are the people of true strength who have something to contribute to society. Contribute to what? America is this diverse you know, amalgam of cultures. It's a tapestry. It's the great melting pot. Uh, you know, we all have heard that. But if you live in America, and you just soak it up, you're nothing more than a sponge. You soak up the messages through the media, the newspaper, through pop culture. Messages that other people have determined and want you to think, want you to believe. The, the war in Iraq is good. Uh, McDonald's is good. Uh, Sprite will quench your thirst. Things like this. And these things, they change weekly, they change almost daily. But if you found, if you build yourself foundation upon Vietnamese culture, you embrace it, you will have this unique set of view, an Eastern, Southeast Asian point of view, this uniquely Vietnamese point of view, to, with which to approach the American culture and to filter out, oh, Americans are pretty good at this, they're pretty open with, you know, um, whatever. And Vietnamese people are kind of uh, gold, kind of um, uh, antiquated with, uh, with that. And so we say, this is better, I'll go with this. And then at the same time, oh, Americans are too liberal, you know, you know, we'll buy them, you know, one night stands, I don't like that. There's a certain value to male-female relations in, in Vietnamese culture that I don't, I want to keep that for myself. And so you get to pick and choose. And in doing so, you create a, your own unique culture, your own unique value system, your own unique point of view with which to approach life in America. And instead of just soaking up what other people tell you through media, through school, through pop culture, you have to say, no, I, I like what you're saying there, but I disagree with you here, and here's why. And so you create this unique sense of self with which to contribute back to that American culture, that great big experiment, and not just being something that's reacted upon. You are a source that is contributed to that experiment. And I think, to add on, basically what we're talking about here is, at the individual level, by embracing the cultures that are surrounding you, America, which is where you live, in Vietnam, where your parents are from, or where you are from yourself. You are giving yourself, I don't know, you're, you're giving yourself tools with which to strengthen your individual person. Uh, you're giving yourself tools with which to say, I am going to decide this for myself. I have my own set of systems, my own principles, my own paradigms, my own beliefs, and I will not be stopped by anyone because these are things that I believe to be true. And these are things that are inherently Vietnamese and American with all of us. Because you can't avoid the Americanness living here, you can't avoid the Vietnamese. So, rather than assimilating, you choose to integrate yourself and become part of that society and change it because you are a part of it. Rather than just accepting point blank whatever is given to you. And by integrating, we don't mean you will become just a mindless drone among the millions and millions of people here. Because once you build up this self-strength, this individual strength, it's very easy to become a very important or key member of society. To make the changes that you want to see seen. To, instead of be a bystander in American society, you take the driver's seat, more or less. Or if not, you're the guy who's on the cab driver where to go. So, what happens here is once you develop this cultural identity for yourself, because essentially my identity is different than yours culturally, and different than yours culturally, but I think there are parts that overlap, and there are parts that are kind of headed in the same direction. And I think with everyone here, I feel like there's something inside of me that makes me want to go in the same direction that you guys want to go. Therefore, with this self-defined, um, established sense of, of, of culture, you will find like-minded people with whom you're compatible, and with whom you have a common denominator. And once you find out this common denominator, whatever it is, Vietnam, Olympic Vietnam, whatever you want to call it, once you figure out that common denominator, then we have things like Unagents, where people gather 300 Vietnamese students from across the United States to all work towards a common goal, right? And once you have that common goal, that shared interest, that shared vision, that, that end point that you all more or less want to reach, that's when you can start working together and have a collective power as a cultural group creating a collective identity. And exactly, creating a collective identity that leads us to be able to build our power more and more through common unity.
Examples that have been successful are, for instance, the Cuban American uh, community in Florida and uh, the Jewish community, especially the Jews. And the Vietnamese people have a lot to learn from Jewish people. Well, I mean, just think about it this way. I got a couple of questions to ask. Why is it that by the time you're 10 years old, if you live in America, you know what the Holocaust is? Or by the time I'm five, I understand that I get to go home or take days off for Yom Kippur and Hanukkah? Or that in America, at least, well, before, you know, 9 11, the consensus most evil man in the world was Adolf Hitler, even though Stalin slaughtered at least 10 times as many people as Hitler did? I mean, it's not, it's not a coincidence that all these things happened to the Jewish community in the world previously. And I think there's something to be said about how the Jews in the world, and particularly in America, extremely talented group, very, very adherent to their cultural norms. But at the same time, they do want to play by the rules of the American society to, a, to an extent that now, I mean, media, politics, oil, I mean, everything is owned by Jewish people, or close to. Um, I might be a little bit off with the numbers, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. Um, but there, there's, something, there's something to be said about the fact that they wear their cultural identities on their sleeves. And they're very proud of the fact that they have Jewish tendencies, Jewish beliefs and principles, and they will not let those go. Instead of being ashamed for having to wear dominant everywhere they go, or having, you know, doing whatever the cultural norms are for the Jewish uh, religion and the Jewish culture, they embrace it and they wear it on the sleeve, as Ben says. And they live it. They say that they love their, their heritage and they abide by it. Unlike Vietnamese people, who say that we embrace Vietnamese culture, say that we love Vietnamese culture, but in fact do not live in a Vietnamese manner. Vietnamese people, our special characteristic is the ability to adapt. It is the ability that has allowed us to remain resilient after under a thousand years of Chinese domination, a hundred years of French domination, Japanese domination, even you know, quote American domination. It is our ability to adapt, to accept the, the dominating culture, and to change our culture because of it. And so what ends up happening is we do what's ever convenient. Every year when Dead comes around, the Indian people celebrate it. But if it's fall of Momota, if the first day of the Lunar New Year falls on a Wednesday, then everyone will just still go to work. No one will take the day off. Well, some people take the day off, but most people do not. And they just wait until Saturday, Sunday, and the closest weekend to do a celebration. You know. Living in a Vietnamese manner. The Lunar New Year is a big deal. It's the first day of the year you're supposed to take it off to set the tone for the rest of your year. If even it's the middle of the week, take the day off. When people refer to that as, oh, the Chinese New Year, Vietnamese people don't say, hey, you know, it's not just the Chinese New Year. It's also the Vietnamese people. Well, some, oh, some people do. In some parts of, you know, the Vietnamese, like the little Saigons in, in say, San Francisco or Chicago, uh, the Americans call it Chinatown. And the Vietnamese people think they don't care. They don't, they don't get raised hell about it. When Vietnamese people come to uh, come over here to the United States, they, they want their kids to integrate into society. And so they encourage, or some people, some people encourage their kids to speak English in the household. And then what, what ends up happening is, you speak you know, English in the household, you mentioned the kid, he comes over here when he or she comes over here when they're like 11, 12, 13, 14. And they speak so much English that by the time they're 18, they begin to forget their Vietnamese. You know, that's a shame. You're living in America. Your English is in, you know, the media, TV, it's everywhere. You can't escape it. It's more important to protect the Vietnamese language in our homes. Because if you want to build contribute your society, build your local communities, and you know, make the Vietnamese communities locally, because that's where you're best suited to do it. Uh, you have you know, the sense of culture, the sense of identity, the language. You need to be close to that. You need to be able to understand the language, speak to the people on you know, that language. If you want to think further, say you want to go back and help Vietnam, you have to be able to speak the language, read and write it, communicate with the people there in a manner that they feel, hey, this is a person that I can trust. If you go back there, there's a language barrier. No matter how many good intentions you have, and how much you want to do, there will be a certain distance, a certain gap that will keep you from the people. You can't go back to getting to the back, you know, getting to the double mile, and things like that. You can't do it. They won't trust you in a certain sense. You have to be able to communicate with them on their, their own terms. Uh, and 
so I think now that we're getting towards for closer to the end of the presentation, we're obviously going to do a brief synopsis of what we've gone through. And I think um, we, I, I suppose you might all be thinking, oh, they didn't really talk about cultural identity too much, or they didn't really mention that word too much, but that's because I think to us we both decided, maybe to you guys, you agree. The word or the nomenclature or whatever you call it, it's unimportant. It's, it's what it is. You know, you, don't, it, you can call me whatever you want to call me, but actually uh, I'm still just me. Right? So at the end of the day, what we're talking about is in order to, I guess, build local power in common unity, model of the UNASA, I think there are a set of steps that Ethan, I believe, is an effective uh, set of steps that you can take. And I think a lot of you being here are already on that way. And essentially what we're saying is, embrace your cultural identity. Don't be ashamed of being Vietnamese. Or if you're not ashamed of being Vietnamese, don't be afraid to try to make American people like it or want to be like it. Or to teach other people about it. To teach culture. people about it. And once you are able to do this, once you're able to fully recognize and accept and be comfortable with the fact that you are a Vietnamese person living in America, you will have then developed a sense of individual strength, uh, so to speak. You have made yourself unique. You've made yourself uh, value, valuable, things that outstanding. Are in exactly. So what you do here is once you have this status, once you are comfortable and self-sufficient and no longer, I guess, swayed by MTV or you know whatever Clear Channel wants to listen to on the radio, once you have this set of what you like, what you don't like, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, when you have those set of beliefs, then you can find other people that have similar beliefs to you. It's easy. They are out there. You guys are all here. It is easy. You guys will all be able to find and work with each other and are compatible to work with one another because there are proponents to your culture, to your individual culture, that are copacetic, that want to reach that goal, that want to reach a shared vision. And once you have that, then you have a collective identity, and you find that common denominator, and through that, <coughs> through that, you start to work together and build the community, and you get this entire snowball effect. And what happens is, you know, you begin to focus better your energy. Knowing what you want to work for, knowing your end goal, I know there are people that, you know, want to save the whales and protect the rainforest, and try to find a way to restructure the economy, and want to find a way to battle corruption. They want to do everything. They, they, they want to do everything. Goes. But what happens is your energies are limited. You only have a certain amount of energy and time. Now if you use all of that to do all these things, like saving kids in you know, Angola and Namibia and then adopting children and you know, Brad and Jennifer, or no, sorry, Brad and Angel, <laughs> Lena style, you know, all that stuff. You, you're, you're wasting your energy because it is much more effective to focus your energies on a limited scope of activities than it is to, I guess, spend all of your time doing everything that you can find. Like, just for instance, if you, if you were still at a light bulb, right, for a few minutes, there is very little chance that you would suffer permanent retinal damage, right? I mean, it's a light bulb. Now, if you were to stare directly into a laser for merely a few moments, you could probably, potentially, harm or destroy your sight permanently. The key is focus. The key is focus. And with cultural identity, thanks you for love. With with cultural identity and with building local power, you're finding a way to first of all focus yourself individually in a direction, in a way that you want to go. Once you have, and then once you find that, once you have that sense of focus, you will just be more confident in your actions. You will know what you need to do. You will find things to do, and you will see people who are after the same things. Which then goes to the next tier of focus, which is once you're done working on yourself, you can then have the community work with you in the same direction and focus once again in the same direction. And it's like it's total cliche, but you really have to empower yourselves before you can empower the community to cultivate yourself. Yeah, and uh, I'm sorry for having said that cliche. But... <laughs> and with that, you'll be better able to contribute to, if you want, say, Vietnam, or homeland, or if you're just thinking locally. Your surroundings here, Little Saigon, uh, San Diego, San Jose, wherever you're from, uh, contribute to that American culture. 
And that's enough. Making that impact is enough. Representing the Vietnamese American cause here in America. That's something. So the Americans, they can be a great people if they choose to be. They only lack the light to show them the way. And so for that, Vin and I giving you, the attendees of this workshop, who hopefully after this will go out and cultivate yourself and make an impact in your American society. <laughs>
you know, ideology that says I can't work with other people through coalitions, I can't join with other causes, I can't help them if they help me, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So we're not, it's, it's just, you're not limiting yourself to just a certain amount of things. You can be very much an advocate for... You don't have to just focus on the Vietnamese cause. Uh, but whatever cause you choose, you'll be better off serving if you have a strong foundation in your own Vietnamese culture. Let's just put it that way. And, and don't spread yourself too thin. I think we have... Uh, yeah, um, I think that um, when you are going out um, and doing community service in the global sphere, uh, you are, in a sense, promoting in, um, the Vietnamese culture also because you, whether you like it or not, you're a representative of the culture. So even if you go to Rwanda and um, choose to go through all those barriers and help those people, it's, you're helping their culture, but you're also helping your own culture. Because you're promoting um, the sense of your culture to another culture. It's an exchange of um, cultural so if you, if, you, if you go there, what you do when you help people, you're Vietnamese, you give them a good impression, you have good feelings towards Vietnamese people. Uh, but unless you yourself you know, actually have you know, some sort of knowledge of the Vietnamese culture, there's nothing to exchange. You see what I'm saying? Just because you're Vietnamese and you help them, of course you're going to say Vietnamese people are like upstanding people. The, the Vietnamese guy helps me uh, do something. But unless you have something, you know, like, a, like a Pokemon card to trade, then you know, there's not that interaction. Yeah, let's... let's from now on, let's refer to our culture as a Pokemon card. It's very good. But what was your name? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think you made a great point because um, you know recently with the, the current education issue, the Vietnamese people don't get a lot of money. I have friends who work in Red Cross, and I said the Vietnamese people they don't get a lot of money, and that's really recognized. I mean, in Little Saigon, we don't get a lot of money to a lot of these young pastors. But one thing they said is we don't get a ball with, um, with the actual volunteer volunteerism. I mean, I think NASA did. I mean, last year we went to Texas, we went to New Orleans. So I think that's something as a whole as a community we haven't done. But I think this point is really important that we, you know, I get it, cultural identity is not about exchanging cards. But I think it's about, like, you know, interacting with each other. You know, like going out to do um, a humanitarian missions with other people. But by that, we're representing ourselves. If they look at us, they see us as, you know, yeah, that would fit. Of course we're being music. You know, and I don't think it's a matter of exchanging, exchanging cards, but through our actions, through, we have come to boy. I mean, yeah, we know, like, one of the things in my office is I always wait for everybody to get their food before I start. That's a big piece thing. And the other people in my office never really did that until now. They realize that's a big piece thing, to wait until everybody gets their food to eat. So I think that's in a way for us to really to share our culture, not necessarily having to trade cards. And to preface that, that. You were able to do that because you knew you actually you actually, you actually do wait for other people. Yeah. Because you knew it was a Vietnamese. You're being Vietnamese and if you don't wait, there's no there's no representation of Vietnamese culture unless you actually do it, live it, embrace it. I think not. Sorry. Uh did, did yeah. Jennifer, right? You had a, another um, um, no. Anybody else? I guess um I, I feel that um in the US our language is downplayed by a lot of Vietnamese American places. For me, um, like names and places like, to me, the reason why we call Vietnam or Vietnam in the US is because that's what we hear, Vietnam. But Vietnam isn't outside of the speech spectrum of English. And so I always say Vietnam, because it's a Vietnam, it's not Vietnam, you know, and we can pronounce it. And like when I go introduce myself to people, you know, and uh, I'm really not a fan of like the, Moves and the fongs and the quacks among Vietnamese. You know, we can pronounce that. I mean, quok sounds so much better than quok. What's a quok? I remember this girl in high school. Her name is like, uh, me, uh, well, her last name was Ho and the first name was Mai. And so, of course, it was like Mai Ho. But I mean, literally, it wasn't Mai Ho, you know. But, you know, a lot of people are like, well, we're in the US, you know, and, you know, Tin, you know, could be thin, pian, pian, and everything, and you know, I just feel that my peers, as being these Americans, like, don't care. I mean, I, I recognize that, I recognize that Americans will never be able to pronounce Nguyen, and I'm okay with that, but I mean, among, you know, being these people, I just feel like, you know, it's like, down That's true, that's, that's a very good example. Thank you for that. Well, um, to bridge on to what he was saying, it's like, why is it that in the Spanish language, Jose and Maria are pronounced as 
the language would be in Spanish, and why can we incorporate our language into the American society? So those are slight changes that you can affect upon the thinking of the American mainstream. Right. So make them accept our being here rather than just say, oh, you can't say it, don't worry, call me John instead. You know, stuff like that. Like they embrace that and we don't. 